Good morning to all of you. Reverend Father Wilfred Azuga, Dr. Ryu, distinguished members for the management of this very prestigious college, distinguished faculty members from different departments of the college. I don't know if there are any parents of students here or not. So, dear friends, the students, it's good to see both ladies and gents spread out into the, as part of the audience. It's indeed been my, I would say, I'm honored to be here. But before I jump into the topic for the day, I want to definitely congratulate the team which rendered the prayer. Can you please stand up? Thank you. Music is in my blood. And you certainly have made me very emotional and happy. Because it was extremely soulful, tuneful, and uh, excellent accompaniment with the right kind of chords being provided. I used to play on the guitar, that's how I learned Western music, I have learned Hindustani music, I have learned Carnatic music. So, I am able to appreciate. In fact, uh, my brother and I used to play the flamenco style on the guitar. I don't know how many of you are aware of the flamenco style the style where we use all five fingers to pluck. And so the left hand is playing with different chords, the right hand. Each finger goes for each string. It's a very complex and if you hear Spanish music, it's wonderful, enjoyable. It can really stir up your emotions. So you people definitely stirred up my emotions today. And that was an excellent beginning for this lecture. And I must congratulate Dr. Rio for getting them on and making this wonderful beginning to this event. I would then like to also thank Dr. Rio and whoever else was involved in deciding to invite me and give me this opportunity and the honor of being here and speaking to you all. I've just turned 70. <laughs> so, you know, when there's a risk, when people go cross 60 or 65, you all run the risk of being bored with an old man talking to you endlessly and old people never know when to stop. I hope I'm not that type. Let's check out. But I definitely have gathered that habit of speaking my mind out and I call a spade a spade. A lot of people I realize this, I don't use words. So here and there I might make some critical comments and uh, if any of, any of you get a little worried or perturbed, I uh, request you to bear with me because I say it as constructive criticism. If at all, you call it criticism. It's more in the form of a suggestion. So let's dive deep into the subject. What do we mean by foundation for innovation? So when I was, uh, when I received the email from Dr. Rio saying that he would uh, like me to deliver this lecture on the day of the foundation day, so I said it has to be topical. And the other thing that's very close to my heart is the younger generation who seem to have missed the opportunity of true learning. And uh, many people don't understand what learning and knowledge is all about. It's come down to just mugging up, reproducing, getting marks and then going out with that slip of paper saying I want a job. That's not what it's all about. So the core topic of my talk today 
is going to be about learning and I thought there couldn't be a better occasion than the foundation day. And in an educational institution. So I thought this was a godsend opportunity for me to talk to a group of youngsters. I was hoping to see a lot more youngsters and less of the faculty, but I think it's the reverse today. Never mind. I have a lot of things to talk to the faculty members too. So let's see what, why is the word innovation all over the papers, all over the media today. Innovation right from morning till evening, every media, whether it's social media or uh, the YouTube or uh, any of the TV channels, it's, everybody's trying to talk about innovation. And then huge funds being allocated, startups, this, that. So what are they talking about? And what is innovation all about? There's a lot of excitement there. I think a lot of people haven't understood what it's all about. So that, that's why I thought, let me lay the foundations for what we refer to as innovation, and then what is required to be done to encourage and nurture innovation. Ultimately, that's what we are all wanting. My talk will aim to incite you, instigate you, and excite you. That's my objective for the day. Let's see if it happens by the end of my talk. Now, innovation is something one achieves when you go off the beaten track. So, it's something unique, something different. You have learned to do or you have developed. It could be a product, it could be a service. And in terms of value, it's at the top of the pyramid. Highest value generation. It can revolutionize the field in which you have innovated. It could be engineering, it could be medicine, it could be anything. Automobiles. At the bottom of the pyramid, you have manufacturing. Now, I'm not trying to play down manufacturing. Please don't misunderstand me. But manufacturing is large chunks and large volumes of products parts, sub-assemblies, whatever it is. It could even be service. That happens in large numbers of relatively much smaller value. Swiggy and those kind of services that we are all using today, for each parcel that he delivers, the profit margin could be hardly a rupee or two. Sometimes they do it even at a loss. That's a different marketing strategy, philosophy, etc. Let's not get into that. But that falls in that level, the bottom of the pyramid, where you have thousands, where millions and maybe even crores of customers or post crores of consumers for that product or service. Next comes the design, which has a higher value addition, value generation. Where you design a product as per an existing product or as per the specifications provided by a manufacturer or a consumer saying I want this kind of a product and you design it then you take, go in, put it into the manufacturing layer it gets manufactured after one or two prototype trials it goes into mass manufacture but the design happens only once and the design may take maybe a year or two depends again on the type of product an aircraft takes five to ten years for design in foreign countries here we take 35 years doesn't matter but once that design cycle is complete manufacturing goes goes on for many many more years decade i would say so design comes at a higher level of value addition so anybody involved in design definitely has that higher value contribution that generating the value the next higher level is conceptual uh, design. So you you don't have a product, or you have, somebody has given you a specification. You want to say, okay, how do I implement or realize that specification into a product or even a service? So like Swiggy, somebody said, I want to be able to get anything from any restaurant at my doorstep. That's the requirement specified by a customer, let's say. Then the designer has to say, okay, how can I meet that requirement? 
He has to conceptualize that product or service. And then, once the concept is ready, goes into a design phase where you work out the various details and parts and parts of the system, then you go into the manufacturing system. Manufacturing could be equivalent to even a service, service provision. So concepting, uh, conceptualizing to a requirement is a higher level than design. Now the conceptualization of a product, let's say an automobile. Today you are talking about electric vehicles. An automobile is also an automobile. Existing product has four wheels. It has a body, it has seats. So that's not really an innovation or yeah, invention in the true sense of the word. So you are modifying or tweaking an existing product and then conceptualizing and taking it through design. And innovation is where you don't have that kind of a thing, a feature or a product. And then you develop that saying, okay, this can be done in a different man manner. A flying car, for example, is an innovation. So if somebody is wanting to get into innovation, it's not against a requirement being posed by anybody. Innovation happens when you yourself want to say, I want to do this in a different way. Then I am using a product and I say, something I want, a feature, is not available in it. Nobody is offering it. So how do I get that feature into that product? Or I want a product which is not available in the market. I want it. It's a revolutionary product. And therefore, how do I do it? So if I want to innovate, I must clear as to what I want and how I should be able to realize that product, how I should be able to create. In other words, in a way, innovator will have to go from to an idea at the top of the pyramid, maybe even conceptualize, and then go to a design and then ultimately manufacture it. May not be one person who does all this, but he can use the services of other people who can conceptualize, design, and then manufacture. It can completely be different, four different people, four different agencies, four different companies or organizations, etc. But one individual or one group of individual, individuals create that innovation, which is a new idea. Even higher than that would be an invention. There is a small difference between an invention and an innovation. I hope all of you are able to appreciate that. Very little difference except that in an invention you can patent it and you get an IPR. Innovation, if, it's, if it fits into specific rules, governing IPR rules, you can even innovate, uh, file for a patent or design uh, registration and so on. So innovation is at the highest value addition in the environment, be it engineering, medical, whatever it is. So that is why everybody is talking about innovation. But nobody is talking about how do you nurture innovation. How many of you are aware of the word ecosystem? Can you raise your hands? I don't see too many hands. Hardly. Okay. Uh, an ecosystem. You have an engineering ecosystem or an education ecosystem. That's what you have in this campus. You have a college, you have uh, classrooms, you have laboratories, you have professors, maybe even research associates, visiting uh, guest faculty, including resource persons like me. That's an ecosystem. If you want something to happen, you must have a corresponding ecosystem to help or facilitate that activity. And it's not, it should not be just one college, just one, for example, quota is taken a, there's a brand in Rajasthan, a place called Kota, where all these IIT coaching classes are conducted, people travel from across the country, live there for six months or one year and try to go through those coaching classes and hope to get into IITs. That's an ecosystem there. Because not one, there are multiple teaching institutions, multiple faculty, then place to live, hotels, all this from the ecosystem. So similarly, for an innovation, you need an ecosystem. Nobody is addressing this. 
innovation just can't happen by itself. It won't happen at the spot. That would be an accidental innovation. It can happen accidentally. But if you really want to tackle innovation or promote innovation, you need an eco ecosystem. And what is the, you know, uh, this uh, ecosystem comprised? Knowledge. First and foremost, if you want to innovate something in electronics, you must know electronics. In-depth electronics. Next some skills. There's a little bit of confusion. A lot of people don't understand the difference or relationship between knowledge and skills. They are both related. Skills is the application of knowledge. Is the art and science of application of a knowledge. And then you develop skills to do something. And in the process of doing, you learn or reinforce that knowledge or even relearn that knowledge. It's a cycle. You acquire knowledge, then develop a skill and do something, and in the process of doing, you learn something deeper, and that reinforces the knowledge, or even sometimes it changes your knowledge. Experience. More you do that cycle that I was talking about, more you learn, more you say what works, what doesn't work. Using a chisel or a saw, I'm a very good carpenter. I've been cutting and uh, using uh, both hand tools and uh, power tools right from the age of six or seven. So, when I use these tools every day, I know what works, what doesn't work properly, what can even damage the part I'm trying to create, what can even damage the tool itself, the saw or a planer. So, the experience, in fact, this is something also I want to highlight. These days when we submit our applications and CVs for a job, we say 8 years application, 15 years, ex uh, 15 years experience. What is the meaning of that word experience? Not going to an office or an organization, signing and drawing a salary. That's not experience. Experience is actually doing it. Those girls who have sung today, that's an experience for you, right? You have performed in front of a gathering today, that's an experience. We who listen to you is an experience. It's real experience of doing or seeing or listening to something. And this can be, again, anything. Engineering, medicine, civil engineering, building, traveling. So the kind of experience that I'm talking about here is the physical act of doing something and learning from it. That doesn't happen, in, at least in our education system, that's being missed out. Both the skill development, today we are talking about skill development as a separate activity. I don't believe that. It's part of the knowledge in, uh, inculcation. It has to be part. And that's why you have laboratories. Right from the class, you are supposed to go to the laboratory and work with your hands. And if you have to, in an electronics lab, if you are given a set, uh, experimental set, test set, which inside which everything is hidden. That's not learning. You are just told to plug wires here and there, take some readings from a meter which is already there in that jig. That's not learning. You've got to phys handle physically the resistor, capacitors, transistor, ICs, put it into a breadboard and physically put, stick the meter, probes of the meter or oscilloscope where you want to. You also know, should know where to put the uh, probe and measure what. How to use a multimeter, how to use an oscilloscope. That is the experience that all of you, the students, are missing today. Because we are making it too easy for them. Say, okay, you only have to do this, just note down this meter. They don't know what is the significance of that meter. Whether it's a current or any, uh, voltage also, they don't know. That's not learning. And why are we doing this? Because we have made it a habit to spoon feed children right from the age of one. Spoon feeding is what we are doing then, we, in my family at least, from the age of 8 months, my wife stopped feeding the kid with a spoon. She said, I'll keep it in the tumbler here, milk, you have it yourself. And if the child learned, she would say, okay, if you don't want, I'm going to take it away. Two, three minutes or maybe even half an hour, then the child would come back saying, give me milk. He said, okay, I'll give it to you at that time. Now you have to drink it by yourself. 
he or she would pick it up and drink. That's how you teach. You need to tell them that if you are not interested in learning, go to hell. If you want to learn, you learn by yourself. Teaching is not about lecturing. Teaching is about facilitating, empowering the student to learn. That's been missed out right from our nursery to middle school to high school. And therefore, once you are they're trained on spoon feeding, even in an engineering college, even in a postgraduate, even in a research thesis, they'll get to uh, they'll expect to be spoon fed. What are we getting out of that? So if that is the situation, we are missing out everything. Nothing will work. Resource persons I am talking about, because you definitely need, there will, nobody is an expert, I don't consider anybody an expert in this world. It's a relative world. Today I might know more about electronic musical instruments than anybody else because I have worked on it for 40 years. But there may be somebody who has worked for 60 years. He is a better expert than me, so I am not an expert in that crowd. So it's, rel it's relative. Depending on where you are and which, which kind of an environment, whether an expert or a resource person. So a resource person is, again, you will, have, you will need multiple resource persons with different specializations, even in the same domain, electronics. Digital and analog are all such wide domains that you can't expect one person, even if he or she has a PhD in digital electronics. They can't be an expert in that field. So you need multiple resource persons to help these people who are uh, acquiring knowledge, who are acquiring skills and doing some work to also assist them and give them additional information, additional knowledge. All this enables a thought process. It's not one individual who is thinking about innovation. It has to be a group's larger the group, better it is for an exchange of ideas. These are all like uh, uh, brainstorming sessions. You need to have, you need to encourage brainstorming. Does the word brainstorming uh, make sense to you? You know, you just want to sit and say, okay, what else can I do? How can I do it differently? That's kind of brainstorming. Or if you have an idea and say, I hope you implement it. Okay, can I use a uh, electronic, uh, digital electronics mode or an analog electronics or hydraulics, things like that. It can be multidisciplinary too. And today in the world, in this world, nothing is pure electronics, nothing is pure hydraulics, nothing is pure mechanical. Everything is a mixture of everything. So it is multidimensional, multidisciplinary. So if you want a proper thought process, because without thought process you, won't, you can't innovate. Even individually, you, not, uh, you want to innovate, you need to have that thought process. And that process, thought process, gets cultivated and reinforced when you have an ecosystem in which everybody is thinking, everybody is innovating, everybody is triggering, uh, path breaking uh, ideas. Last comes the facilities. Of course, a facility is very easy to build. A lab, if you have money, you could get uh, money. Today there is no wealth of money, let me tell you that. If you really want to do it, well, even if you get only 1000 rupees, I started my business with just 10,000 rupees. No grants, no loans, no nothing. 10,000 rupees in 1979. And I started flowing back. Every rupee I got, I just flowed it back and that builds up the capital. Because it's not that I didn't want uh, the loan, banks won't give it because they don't trust you. When you're uh, most of the uh, uh, SSI those days, the word MSME was hadn't yet been caught coined those days. So if I went there as an SSI entrepreneur, he would make fun of me, the bank manager. It was humiliating. But then I said, okay, let me do it for my own. And I flowed back and grew the organization. And soon enough, it was enough to run. And once you have a track record of three, four years, then it's easy to. Uh, convince them saying, yes, I have at least a balance sheet, I have at least a profit in my second. Based on this, give me whatever. Even then they won't give you what you want. They'll give you a fraction of what you want. So, facilities can be created. There's no problem there. And that's one of the easiest to do. And only when all these are there, then you have innovation. That innovation encompasses all these. And this is the picture of the entire innovation ecosystem. I don't see this existing, and this is what is so special about Silicon Valley in the US, in California. 
you have every each one of these components available. If you have people, VCs, which, uh, venture capitalists, who are willing to give you any amount of money, facilities, you can even hire them to go to so-called uh, workspaces, hired workspaces, everything else is there. And that's what need, is needed if you really want to get into innovation. So the, as I said there, let's go into each one of these. I said facilities, I'm starting from the reverse order now. Facilities, I said, is very easy to set up. All you need is some money, buildings, and you set up workbenches, equipment, etc., etc. The thought process, once the facilities are there and people are there, the thought process will happen. But it can't be just people. It has to be people who think differently. Innovative. And those people are not just raw engineers. They are people with experience and who have at least some domain expertise. Experience. Okay, so as you see, the circles become smaller and smaller and the core here is knowledge. Knowledge is at the core of any value addition including design or innovation or conceptualization etc. Et and this knowledge has to be solid, solid. Not superficial knowledge the way it is being acquired in educational institutions today. So that's what I refer to in the title of my talk, knowledge as the foundation. And if you have knowledge with the other peripheral requirements, then you can be certain innovation will happen. Innovation along with product design, service design, whatever you want. So how does one acquire knowledge? I'm coming to the core of my talk, I hope. I don't exceed my time. Can you give me a warning when I'm 40 minutes, 45 minutes through? Sure. Now, knowledge, I've tried to draw this graphically in like a tree. I consider knowledge as the root of the tree. And skills are the top, the leaves and the branches of the tree. And the experience, with experience, I don't know, some, something wrong with the presentation. Is this a PDF itself or is it a PPT? No. PPT. So experience, with experience, what happens is that the tree grows. And you also get larger fruits. There's one thing I want you to notice in this. It's not just the trunk and branches of the tree that have grown, the roots have also grown. And I said the roots are the knowledge. So as you learn, your skills develop, your thought process improves, but knowledge also grows. You get deeper and deeper knowledge of the domain in which you are working. And as I said, more the knowledge, more the skills you acquire, so it's an endless loop. How many of you are aware of uh, the word bootstrapping? What is bootstrapping? I don't see a single word. I would like to see. Huh. What is your understanding? Are there any mics uh, available for this? I would like somebody to respond and say what you understand by the word bootstrapping. Very good. Increase in the game, but how do you achieve that? How do you achieve? What exactly is uh, done is the meaning of you, the result you have explained, but how is that increase in the game achieved? By connecting the two, in terms of transistor, connecting the two transistors, uh, the emitter of one to the base of that. Can you explain the form of a block diagram or something? What are you actually trying to do? Because you have bootstrapping amplifier. capacities. Bootstrapping. Huh. It is an amplifier. Okay. 
I'll go into this because this is something that I'm very passionate about. Bootstrapping. Is there anybody else who has a different explanation to bootstrapping? Anybody else? Okay, let me explain. What is the difference between computer booting and bootstrapping? Booting actually is a slang. It's a shortened form of bootstrapping. The computer actually is still... Oh, it's moving. Hello? Are you okay. So, computer actually, when you switch it on, it is bootstrapping. Booting is a shortened form, and we all taking it for granted that booting is what it is doing, it is actually bootstrap. And what does it do? When the computer is dead, when it is not switched on, it has no knowledge, it has no brain, it has got brains which is not activated. So when you switch on, there is only a small little chip called the BIOS, basic input output system, which has got just enough intelligence for it to read the keyboard and drive the screen. So it can put a couple of characters on the screen. It cannot just read the keyboard. So if you type something on the keyboard, as part of booting, it says press F1, F2, F3 for something else. If you don't do anything, it auto after a delay, it goes on automatically to read the rest of the BIOS, which gives it the intelligence and knowledge to read the hard disk. So it, it acquires the knowledge to read the hard disk only when it is powered up through the use of a small program called the BIOS. BIOS is also a small program. And when it has, is able to read the hard disk, it is able to read the operating system and understand. So it acquires more and more knowledge with knowledge it has already acquired. This is the part of, this is the process of learning. And once you've got the operating system, if you ask it to load Office, Microsoft Office, Excel, this, that, whatever you want, those are application software. So with knowledge it already, already, already has, and this is, if you think about it, this is what we all have done right from school. You learn the ABC in the first class or nursery, and using ABCs you create words, and using words you create sentences, then we all do this. Stage by stage. This is the bootstrapping. But the computer doesn't mug up and do anything. It acquires the knowledge the way it's supposed to acquire. And today we are even talking about artificial intelligence where the knowledge it, it acquires can be modified by itself based on a database or instance of whatever it is asked to do. Google does it. When you repeatedly go to Google and search for something, it knows what I what you like automatically throws those as your likely search options. That's nothing but artificial intelligence and that can be carried to any extreme. So this bootstrapping, even though we are supposed to be doing it, we are not assimilating the, the soul of the learning process because we have been taught, the teachers particularly are to blame because in the schools they say, reproduce whatever is in the textbook, only then you will get marks. We have become marks oriented rather than knowledge oriented. Isn't that a pity? Because if you know the not if you acquire knowledge, you can reapply that knowledge. That's why I talk, asked you that question. See, the what you feedback should be something taken from the process, output. Part of the output, feed back to the input, then it reinforces and the lady also said it increases the gain. Very correct. Provided you take the required information, if you feed noise as a feedback, you don't get, you will get oscillations of uh, noise again as output. We don't want noise. So this is what we should be doing right from school and even in engineering colleges. And the learning process has to happen absolutely, actually from the students, not from the teaching staff. They should be encouraged. And believe me, 
you are talking about the drona. I don't teach them. I tell them, of course, a little bit of foundations, I try to reinforce what they have learned in colleges without understanding and appreciating the practical significance, be it an inductor or a capacitor or a transistor. Once I have done that, then I say, now you go and read yourself. I can even point to some pages of a book and say, you read it, understand it, and then you implement it yourself. Believe me, they are able to do it. And once they get that as a habit, it becomes your way of life. And that's what I call the art of learning. If you are, can master the art of learning, you can learn anything. What prevents you from learning anything? And if you don't learn anything, there's no stopping you. There are no boundaries. So the kid starts with that. But if you spoon feed that kid and say, okay, you don't do it, I will put it for you, kid is not going to learn. And when you go through this cycle, which I believe should be seeing and reading, understanding and finally doing it. You have to do. Only then you learn. Just by listening, just by reading, just by copying, you don't learn. So, these are some pictures from my home library. And the same environment that I got from my parents, I provided for my children. This is me. Is there a pointer in this? This is me. This is maybe about 40 years old or 30, 35 years old. That's my son. I am showing him a bicycle wheel, his own bicycle, which he had, he had himself removed. He was about five or six, six years old, six or seven years old. And I showed him how the balls in the ball bearing here can be removed how they can be cleaned, how can they, they can be greased and put back. This is what my father showed me. He didn't teach me, but I observed my father. My father used to do even the patchwork of the tube at home. I'm talking about what? Uh, I'm 70 now, so my father would have been uh, 35, 40 at that time. So here he is. Now once he has gone through this and he's understood, his curiosity is not limited. So he said, okay, what else can I learn from this cycle? Or anything else new? Then I, he got exposed to aero modeling here. He is actually building an aero model using balsa wood. He has a blueprint here. That's a blueprint. Now, how many of you have encountered blueprints? If at all you have encountered, it should be in engineering college. I don't know. Today, blueprints are out of fashion. But any drawings, you would have seen only in engineering college. He has been exposed to it when he was in school. He was in middle school, not even high school there. And here, he is working on a vice. This is my actually my dining room. There is a table there with a vice. And he is working, using a plier, doing something connected with, with his hobby. This is also equally uh, a learning process. And here, this is a hobby workshop I organized for school children from government schools hardly about two or three years back. In the electronic city where I work, we have a, a network of 13 to 14 government schools. Poor children, they come from poor economic background. They don't have any facility at home. They don't have any hobbies at all. And it was amazing to see them getting so excited, the girls as well as boys, I showed them how to make models using cardboard, literally uh, low value, even waste cardboard, and scissors, knives, they recall. Two weeks, they enjoyed themselves, and they made models of railway carriages and even an aircraft, Boeing 730, uh, Airbus A320. They made such a big model using just cardboard and paper. And at the end of it, it's not just doing. You can see, I could see the, the glee and the self-confidence in their faces and in their body language. It had drastically changed. Because now they said, having done this, I can do anything. Uncle, can you give me some other model? Uncle, can you give me some other challenge? They used to ask me. 
people, uh, uh, students who were extremely shy, who extremely, uh, you know, um, not confident of asking anything, getting up, standing, they had drastically changed. And one of my own employees, her son also was in this group. One day she came to me and said, Sir, what have you done to my son? He's changed drastically. He was a very mischievous uh, kid, creating a lot of trouble at home. And she said, now he's drastically changed because all the time he's trying to do something and learning all of it. This is what is required for the, be it engineering college students or even science or arts students. You need to have self-belief. Oh. This is what you need to be by the time you get out of college. Full radiating confidence, radiating uh, your self-belief to say, yes, I am capable of doing anything, give me any challenges. If I don't know it, I will learn it and do it. That's the point I am trying to make. The, if you have developed the art and science of learning all by yourself, and to the faculty I say, teach this. Don't spoon, spoon feed them. You need to encourage them. You need to support them. You need to nurture them. Not to the extent of spoon feeding, but show them the uh, guidelines to say, please do this, please read it. It will be to your benefit. And if you don't do it, because once they are out of college, wherever job, they are taking up a job, there is nobody to teach them. In fact, people are waiting to cut them across. Because it's a structure of competition today in any job. So nobody's going to teach. They will have to learn by themselves and perform whatever task is assigned to them. So if they are not used to it, by the time they come out of college, they are going to find it very difficult to survive. And why are we now talking about unemployable graduates and unemployable engineers? Because that is missing. If that was there, the self-confidence as well as the ability to learn if they didn't get one job or the other, they would start doing something up. They would become entrepreneurs. And there's no limitation that they should go only into uh, this kind of a job or that kind of a job. It's an open world because, as I said, if they are confident that they can learn anything and do anything, and that precisely, believe me, this is precisely the belief with which I tendered my resignation at the jail after serving there for 10 years. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I said, I can survive. I was very frustrated. I, was, I didn't want to work in a public sector where original ideas and uh, uh, new ideas could be implemented. There was no appreciation, no even uh, inclination to listen to my idea. So I said, why should I be here? The first thing I wanted to do was to get out of there. So on the, on the day I submitted my resignation, I didn't know what I was going to do. But I was very confident that I would survive outside in some form or the other. I had a whole amount of skills, and I said, if I have so many skills, why should I worry? How much time do I have? Am I through? Ah, thanks. So, this is what I want, I wanted to emphasize here, saying, in a learning atmosphere, the teachers, the professors, lecturers, whatever you call them, they are basically teachers. They need to empower the children not by spoon feeding but by encouraging them to think encouraging them to in fact uh, in drona i have trainees who come from very poor background and therefore they don't have the environment at home which, in, which encourages them to think and ask questions they're scared to ask questions i open them up sometimes on one-on-one -on -one to say don't feel shy nobody's going to learn. even if somebody laughs don't care about it you want to learn, if you don't know something, uh, don't understand something, if you don't ask, you are the loser. Isn't it? Who's the loser? He, is, he or she is the loser. So, sooner you change, the better. Sooner you become bold. In fact, this morning, I think I was discussing with you or Anusha, I think, on, the, uh, on my way from the station. When you start asking questions, even for the faculty, it's a reassurance that at least one or two people are understanding what you are trying to teach them. They are getting interested. There may be others who are interested, but they are not understanding, but they don't have the boldness to stand up and ask a question. So you have to facilitate that. 
you have to become more friendly with them rather than having a barrier between a teacher and a student. This normally used to happen in schools, but I, I don't know if it happens today, but I would go to the extent of saying it, the same kind of relationship should happen even in a college. Encourage them, even if they are shy in a, uh, in a classroom, encourage them to come and meet you outside the classroom, in your chambers. And if this happens, that same, it, it becomes a personality change. And that's what I'm trying to highlight here. It's the personality which is the first impression when you go for a job, job interview. Even before they have asked you about electronics or mechanical or anything else. The way you enter, the way you sit and the way you say good morning or good evening may even capture the job for you. Looks like a smart person, isn't it? But that's what we say. And that's what we are looking at. And believe me, to this day, I've recruited so many engineers, I'm not bothered to go through that mask card. Not even marks. Because marks don't mean anything to me. Anybody can mug up and get marks, whether it's first rank or first class or whatever it is. But I check one is the personality. Is he or she feeling self-confident? And that can be reflected in one glance when he or she enters my room, I know. That's the first impression. Second impression, is this person capable of learning? I'm willing to teach, but is this person interested in learning and capable in learning? Even if I see a small, small little sign of the capability and interest, done. I hire that person and then I, the training happens, then they perform phenomenal jobs. Phenomenal jobs is what I would say. Uh, I run two companies, one is into aerospace, avionics, complete products which we design. Complete product. It's not just a PCB or a circuit or a software. There is software included in it. There is hardware included in it. There is mechanical design in it. Thermal uh, considerations, cooling. Vibration. Design for vibration. Design for manufacturing. Design for reliability. Every one of these they get trained. And it takes hardly six months to train them. And that too, not like a classroom. Do it. Read it. Understand it. Do it. And not one aspect, not one aspect. And they have ultimately delivered whatever is in my catalog. They are all trained by these so-called unemployable engineers. They are not unemployable. You find them unemployable when they come out of these colleges, mainly because the education system has failed them. And that's why I say to the faculty members here, please change that. You have a much bigger problem on your hand right now because, as I said, this entire mentality of learning has to start from younger age in the schools. And I even go to the extent, let me have to complete this, maybe I will run out of time. Huh. So this is exactly what I've been talking about. Inspire, the role of the teacher. Inspire, facilitate. So uh, this kid I was talking to you about, my employee's kid who went through that hobby, now he calls me on the phone and said, Uncle, I want to do this. Can you give me some ideas? And over the phone, I give him an idea and he implements it in his home. How is this happening? It comes from that inspiration, facilitate, give him some hand-holding. If you want some help, it could be an explanation or it, sometimes it could, it could even be, so um, you give him a tube of Fevicol, saying, okay, use this for as an adhesive. Or you give him some modeling knife, saying use this and give it back to me. So whatever is required, you have to identify what that kid is interested in, in what he wants to show, do, and help him, guide him into that correct slot, track, encourage, counsel. And where some people are going wayward, you need to counsel them. In, in fact, especially in uh, the case of engineering students, they may have aptitude in certain domains but not in some other domains. And this comes out of either family background or their exposure or their likings. Now, the students are blindly getting into electronics or mechanical or something without knowing what it's all about. When I took, took, uh, chose electrical engineering in my engineering, I knew what it was about. Because I had done a lot of work. My brother was a civil engineer, my uh, other elder brother was an electrical engineer, my, mechanic, my father was a mechanical engineer. And we have done my father used to rip out the uh, engines 
from his car and put it in the uh, veranda. Not only his car, but even friends' car. To the extent of pulling out piston rings, crankshafts, and I've done the same thing. I've done the same thing. And I was an electrical engineer. How did I manage to, to rip out the crankshaft of, a, of my car? It's because I self belief. I'm talking out of experience. That is why I'm talking with a lot of conviction. I'm not just delivering a lecture for the sake of delivering a lecture. I'm talking from personal experience. And that personal experience goes beyond what I have done, watching my father, what he has done, what he achieved, and now what my children are, have achieved. So what I'm talking about is something that has been more or less proven. And that's why I'm talking with a lot of conviction and with a lot of confidence. This needs to happen. Institutions. I have already said this, but apart from just having facilities, including inviting me to talk here, is something all institutions should do. I am very passionate. Others may not be as passionate as I am, but then an exposure to different people from industry also adds out of the 100 students that may be here, even if 10 get inspired, the job is done. And those 10 might inspire many others. It solves the bootstrapping. That bootstrapping is something so uh, so wonderful that you can apply that to understand anything you want. And one more point which I already have made a passing reference to. Today, in uh, industry, it's not just electronics, just not just software, not just mechanical engineering. You need to know a little bit of everything. Then you will shine. That also encourages innovation. Without that, you can't do it. Because even to understand things, when you can understand water flowing in a pipe, you can analogously compare that to current flowing in a conductor. The water flow you can physically see, so it's easier to understand. Current you can't see. But when you do you make an analogy, it's easier to understand. I have tried this experiment, this also works beautifully. So there is a challenge for you teachers also, because you must know how to explain various principles in such a way that the student, and it will vary from student to student. It will, you will have to figure out which student understands what kind of analogy and give that kind of analogy. Then you become a favorite teacher. He, he or she becomes a favorite student for you. And this can expand. I think I've said a lot of things. And this is not the end. Uh, I could have gone on for at least another couple of years, a uh, couple of hours. But then, once the beginning is made, I am hoping that I have sown the seeds of thinking and the so, sown the seeds of uh, the so-called learning to learn. This is what I call it, learning to learn. So if you have understood what learning is all about, then you can rule the world. And innovation or whatever else you want to do, is well within your grasp and you will be a very, very uh, sought after person wherever you go in whatever job and that's what we all want to be ultimately we want to contribute to society we all want to contribute to this great uh, nation uh, we are nowhere near where we should have been by now we should have been uh, equivalent to or must have should have surpassed China but unfortunately we have failed and there is no dearth of knowledge there is no dearth of intelligence we are all very, very intelligent people. The grey matter available in everybody is the same. It's like having one terabyte mem uh, memory in a PC, but you only use 10 kilobytes. The rest is going waste. That's what's happening. And if you can trigger this among the students, you achieve your dream. Thank you for your very patient uh, listening. Thank you, sir, for your inspiring talk. When I started, I addressed sir as a doctor, as I feel he is truly an innovator and motivator for innovation. So, sir started his speech uh, for foundation for innovation by creating ecosystem which is the heart of any system. The fact that the education must focus on knowledge for skills is really motivating and realistic as well to meet the contemporary demands of the industry in particular and society in general. His address to the teaching community 
to nurture the art of learning among students is appreciated by all of us here. Let us take some questions from the audience for holistic interaction with the esteemed resource person. I now invite students and faculty to clarify their queries. Sir, so I will start with my first question. Continuing with the discussion we had the other day, or just in the morning, regarding passion. I feel passion is the first step towards innovation. Mm. So is it that as a teachers, we need to facilitate students towards innovation or first towards passion for what they are doing? Uh, it's a good question. I believe that passion starts at a very young age, like it did for me. Music was in the family, music was one of the passions. To a certain extent, it was also forced into us, but aerospace was a passion. Uh, again, it became, because it became a passion because when we moved to, I was born in Delhi, then spent some years in Vishakhapatnam where my father was working in the shipyard and he used to take us on to the uh, ships under construction. So we were all fully familiar with how ships are built and how they are launched into the water and so on. And from there, when my father retired, he moved to Bangalore, which happened to be his hometown. And that's where the first thing I noticed as soon as I arrived in Bangalore was these aircraft flying there. They hardly used to be any civil air flights those days, hardly one in a day. And most of the time, there used to be these aircraft, fighter aircraft of HAL, which would be flying in the skies. So I took a fascination for that. So that's how the passion started. And then I started making paper models, both my brother and I. Paper gave way to cardboard models. And then cardboard models gave way to real scale models of aircraft. And then I started going to British Council to read Flight Magazine. Flight Magazine is a very well-established magazine that's been uh, under publication for easily 100 years now. So I started reading those. And even much before I joined the chair, I knew a lot more about aircraft than many people working in the chair. So it starts as a passion. Again, what uh, nurtures passion is the, uh, the encouragement of hobbies. And that's why I say, don't push children only into studies, studies, studies. Encouragement, I wanted to say this, my mother would not allow us to sit idle even for one minute. Anytime she saw us sitting, any of us, my sibling, myself or my sibling, we were sitting idle without doing anything, she would say, why are you sitting idle? Go and do some work. And if you don't have work, work in the sense, could be studies, it could be something around the house. And if she, if she says, nothing, if there is nothing, go out and play. Go out and play. And not once, many times she has said this to all of us. So playing games is also part of the learning. And it uh, adds to the personality of the individual, boy or girl. Today there is no differentiation between boy and girl. Girls also do. My daughter started riding a motor, motorbike when she was in first PUC. She must have been those days. This was in uh, 95. Very few girls were riding motorbikes. She said, what is that? I want to ride. I said, fine, go and ride it. So you have to see what is interesting as long as it's not life-threatening. Allow them to engage in activities which will get them that experience that I was talking about, doing something. And that causes the passion. If they do five or six different types, one of them, they will be more passionate. The more they find it more. And one thing which I, I forgot to identify in one of my slides. Learning has to be fun. Why do children go out and play? Because they find it uh, entertaining. You can make your engineering lectures fun by interacting with them in the labs. It can be fun. And once it is fun, they apply their main mind get passionate, learn it even better. I hope I have answered your question. I need at least 10 questions. Otherwise, I am not leaving the podium.
Good morning. Thank you, Sushant. I thank management for giving me an opportunity to speak here like this. Uh, I'm a student, so finally a student. No. I'm in chaos now. The thing is, I came to Bangalore to study music, to start with music, because um, uh, soon after my 12th, I started learning classical Hindustani from Kirana Gharana, Dr. Gangu Bahandas, since you. Uh, I came here just because uh, there were my parents uh, <laughs> did not allow me to uh, study music class there. So I came here to start something like this. Um, here I appreciate the institute, here I appreciate the aura, vibe I get. I've been always good in academics, I've read above average. I've always been, I'm like a thank lecturer for that. Uh, but there's confusion now. Like, uh, I've always been good at my music classes as well. I learned cl classical guitar, I'm a like guitar, uh, acoustic lead, and classical Hindustani. And I came here, I learned for two months classical Carnatic. So now, uh, uh, I did not get any opportunities to exhibit myself, I'm like my, you know, whatever I had in me. Um, but but uh, soon after my engineering, my parents, you know, how to convince my parents? The question is, how to convince my parents? Like. I know I am good at that thing, that field as well, but my parents think that I am even good at this field because civil engineering has always been above average in my field. Mm -hmm. So there is a chaos between choosing my opposite thing. Uh, my parents educated. My father is civil engineer and my mother is also good at the uh, field. To convince them is very difficult. When they are educated and to say them what we are and what we want to be is very difficult. They ask me to do what, what I am good at. It's like you are a civil engineer now. You have a good feel. I mean, like you are educated. You are you have good I mean, you are good at academics. Why can't it uh, be in that field and go in that field? But I want I want to do sing music field as well. So what can I do? This is a chaos. Choosing how to convince the parents. Uh, tough question to answer. But uh, if I was in your position, I would have taken the decision that I wanted. When I quit my job at a jail, my father was extremely un unhappy, extremely upset, and uh, he even stopped talking to me. But I said, I was very clear in my mind, I wanted to do something that I enjoy. And that's the point I was making during my presentation. We have to enjoy what we're doing. During our uh, breakfast, I think I was interacting with you, and I said, the, what are you achieving in life? What is your objective in life? I feel the objective in anybody's life should be to achieve happiness and spread happiness to whoever is around you. If you do that, everybody will want to be close to you. Correct? You are, you are spreading happiness. How do you uh, quantify happiness? One is that many people say, I derive my happiness by drawing a paycheck. Whether it's 30,000 or 40,000 or 1 lakh, you get a paycheck every month. But is that all that gives you the happiness? Majority of the people who draw even fat paychecks are unhappy basically, on some count of the other. They are squeezed right through the day in their offices, wherever they are working. So they don't have time to spend with their children. In many families today, even the Lady of the house is working somewhere. So neither mother or father is spending enough time with the kids. So ultimately, the kids are unhappy. So what are you achieving in that family? Nothing. So the way I look at it, happiness, if you draw it as an equation, equals the financial quantity, uh, quantitative amount that you get as a salary, plus equivalent amount is for you to de uh, define whatever you allocate for your singing time, practicing music, listening to music, playing games, interacting with friends, all that put together, 24 hours of a day, quantify the way you, so that will vary from person to person. If you attach a higher value for one hour of music, somebody else may not attach that much, maybe zero they might attach, because if they are not interested in music, there is no value for them. So only you can decide what gives you happiness and you have to move along that path. And that's what I would do, that's what I did. To this day, I don't do anything that makes me unhappy. If I'm in a situation where I'm unhappy, I get out of that environment. 
So that's the only advice because I can't say go against the wishes of your parents. Strictly speaking, you have to sit, and that's where the, the family interactions also need to be nurtured from a uh, young age to a, post, uh, to a situation where, like when you are in college or just about graduating, they should deal in and say, okay, it's your life, you take the decisions that you want. To that end, you need to be empowered by the parents as well as the education system. You're on your, on your own. It's not that you're cutting off the relationship with the parents. But the parents have to trust your decision making. That's what I've done. In, my, in the case of my two children, I trusted their decision. I said, you do what, whatever you want to do and whatever you think is correct for you. To just ex expand on that, my daughter, a very good student, she got, I think, 94 or 95% in her SSLC, but she had made up her mind that she will not do engineering, she will not do any science. She said she wanted to be an artist, painter. I said, fine, I'm okay with that. Are you sure you don't want to do PUC also? Because tomorrow you want to come back and join some other mainstream, you minimum you need is a PUC. She said, I'm very clear, I don't want. She said, I want to be an artist and only an artist. And she joined right from school, went to Karnataka Chitrakala Parishad, which has a five-year, at that time it had a five-year art bachelor of fine arts course. She went and uh, went there with some of the paintings she had made. She got selected, she got a scholarship, she joined there. She's now an artist. I never interfered, I never felt unhappy about it. So that is the relationship between the child and the parent. If the family can nurture that, everybody benefits, everybody is happy. But if the parents are the type where they say, no, no, I want you to do that, you shouldn't do. In fact, even yesterday's paper, there was a similar case where some engineering a girl had graduated or in the final year and she said, I was working on Hindustani music, but my parents have prevented me from learning. Those are all cases that should not be there. That situation should not be there. But then, if you are not in a proper relationship with parent, then it's difficult for me to comment on that or to advise him on that. Ideal situation should be where the parent trusts you, you trust your parent. At least by the time you are coming out of college. And the same thing happened with my son. He went abroad, he did this, he was, like I said, he, he was so crazy about aero, aero modeling, etc. that he wanted to be, get himself a degree in aerospace. He applied to the IITs, First year he did not get, so the second option was to uh, get into electronics branch in uh, through CET. He was in JCE in Mysore for about uh, six or eight months. By that time he got the next year's JE again he went and applied. He got a higher rank, he got aerospace, went to IIT. He graduated, then from there he went straight to Stanford, did MS and PhD in aerospace. Today he is an aerospace designer working on a supersonic jet project in the US. That's what I think. And this is, there are all dreams that come true, at least as far as I'm concerned. You all have to dream that way. And for you to uh, conceptualize those dreams, you must have some background of your you know, young age where you say, okay, I like this, I don't like this. If you don't have an opportunity to say what is what you like and what you don't like, then you can't make up a, your decision. That's what I'm saying is wrong with our education system. Schools should have hobby classes. You should be taken to factories in schools, in high schools, to say this is a mechanical factory, this is an electronics factory, this is a something else, civil engineering. Do you like this or look that or like that? If you are not able to make up, at least you've got an exposure. Next level will be okay, and you will further visit with something else. That's what I call by, as facilitators and nurturing of students. If you have that, then you will be very clear in your mind the parents also you are able to convince. But this is an unfortunate situation. I think I would still... Uh, see, ultimately, you also have to realize that once you have taken a decision, you are wholly and totally responsible for that decision. Tomorrow you can't blame your parents saying, oh, I took music but I am not able to earn enough. My friends are all earning uh, four times as much as I am earning. So 
So you can't say I'm unhappy. Correct? So that is where your self-belief comes in. If you say, okay, I want to be so seriously interested in uh, music, you must say, okay, I will do whatever needs to be done and I will do, uh, I'm confident that I will get onto a, becoming a professional musician and I will earn enough and I will be happy. That's the only way I can answer. Sir, I have a very small question. Yes. I'm yes. Dr. Vincent. Yes. Yes. There are many job seekers or students may come to you because uh, you have a company especially working on innovations. They themselves are not innovators. But how do you really convert them as innovators when they come? Because you being a, running a company which works more on innovations, the background of the people who come to you are not have, really having that passion or maybe innovating ideas. But how do you really convert them as innovators because the same problem we are also facing here mm. that you know as you said that you know the students are of a di different background that we come we cannot consider each and every one of the same angle everyone has their different uh, you know background so it is a bit difficult for us to understand them well in one particular angle so how do you do i don't believe that everybody can be converted into an innovator not possible Everybody can't be a musician, everybody can't be a um, civil engineer or whatever it is. They must have a genuine interest and they must have the inherent capabilities to put in all the effort that is required to specialize in a particular field. But innovation, as I said in my presentation, if you have the ecosystem and you put this person in that eco innovative ecosystem, it, there is a possibility that that person can be an innovator. But no guarantee. No guarantee. It's like saying that you put everybody into this college and everybody will get from 1 to 100 ranks in the final year. That cannot happen. The best of colleges, there will be a few who will shine out, who will assimilate the best and produce the best. There will be others who have acquired equal amount of knowledge but not come up to the highest levels of understanding the knowledge and uh, getting marks in the exam. So I don't say that anybody who joins my company will be an innovator. But it's, again, it's not that they become useless. I may have an innovative idea. I, may, I use them to implement that idea. As I said, the innovation idea has to be converted into a concept. And that concept has to then design, go through a process of design to break it down into brick and mortar uh, equivalents and ultimately you get a product or a service at the base level. They can be part of the chain. That's a huge value addition. Nothing wrong with that. You can't make the entire population of India innovators. That's certainly not possible. And you can't even aim for that. Can I have an answer to your questions? Sir, I was uh, just introspecting on the value pyramid that you had projected in your one of the slides. And in that top of the pyramid was the uh, innovation mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. at the bottom was the manufacturing mm -hmm. and yeah. in between concept and mm -hmm. uh, design. car design. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that innovation as you are uh, stressing upon, it is not easy to yes. get it. Yes. It's one of the toughest yes. uh, tasks. Uh, however, see, uh, innovation by itself will not yield success. Uh, uh, what I feel is innovation by itself mm. may not yield success. Right. It has to get translated into society in the form of useful products right. or services. Absolutely right. That's what you did in the form of bringing out the electronic uh, uh, instruments and other uh, aspects. Uh, very few people can do this. Uh, not all uh, can do. Many times innovation remains in the laboratories. Correct. It doesn't get translated into Correct. market. Correct. Nobody markets Correct. it or they don't have the potential to market it. It requires huge amount of uh, finance also. At the same time, a uh, lot of logistics are necessary. Correct. Correct. So, uh, how could you do it at your time? You just, you told, no, you did it only with 10,000 capital or something like that. That is really amazing for all of us, astonishing. Uh, in the sense, how you could do it? Is it because you didn't have much of a competition at that time? Because, see, that at that time, the time was very different. 
industrial scenario was different competition was not at this landscape today's competition is so fierce that even before innovation comes into market there is there are n number of companies or people bringing out um, imitating the same innovation and bringing out the products or services and they market it already and by that time your innovation is already outdated so thus how could you do that with just 10000 capital uh, was it really 10000 only or you got it funded <laughs> <laughs> multiple questions is raised uh it actually supports the answer i gave you about innovation not everybody can be an innovator not in all innovations are actually success as a business innovation has happened but it has not yielded the success whether financial or anything whatever else so it's true that not all innovations uh, yield to anything mass uh, what you call the um, disruption uh this other point about yeah the competition yeah i was lucky that there wasn't much of a competition initially because it was a very niche market to this day the market is not i an explosive market as you would for how for the keyboards what was used there today you have casio you have yamaha you have roland you have core whole variety apart from the very cheap unknown brands of chinese made So that's an explosion. That's a global market, running into maybe million pieces per month. Mine was exclusively aiming at uh, meeting the needs of Indian classical musicians. Very very restricted field, and I had in-depth knowledge of classical music as a performer, and therefore I could try a conversation with a musician in the language of musicians. When they say sari gama or some rag. Hamza Dhani, etc. I knew what they were talking about, and when I referred to various 22 shrutis, etc., they know, know, they also get to know that I understand their language. So because of that, I was able to strike a relationship with them, and very often they would say, "Can you make this provision in this product? Is it possible?" And I would say, "Yes, I will try." Or if I was confident, I would say, "Yes, I can make it," and immediately incorporate that change or improvement, give it back to them. So it was again that feedback loop. I talk to them, get their ideas, implement it, show it to them. Gain increases like the lady, the lady pointed out. That that feedback loop is a phenomenal loop, bootstrap it. Only thing is we are missing out. We are not using that bootstrap. So it's not that we never had competition all along. Very soon there was competition, all kinds. small guys trying to imitate some small guys trying to bring it in a small you know wrist size tanpuras because i knew acoustics i knew that smaller the size the acoustics will not resonate this those people did not know some people thought oh these are all very simple circuits they, uh, they can produce the sound but it has to be stable shruti shuddha he said right shruti has to be stable if it drifts up and down your shruti is gone If you are not musicians, these are all finer nuances of the product which I knew, and I ensured that musician got the product that they deserve to use. So that because of that, I was always I was able to stay ahead. Even to this day, we have competition, but we keep innovating, coming up with newer features based on the chips that are available year to year. So we add features, we uh, make new products. We have an electronics fermenter. I don't know if you have heard about it. You know what is a fermenter? Twenty-four strings, each tuned to a different note. So you tune it as per a raga, and then you just strum it. This is electronic where you set the notes and store it in memory. You don't you don't have to recall. I mean, you don't have to tune it on stage. You just recall it from memory, like a telephone number. These are all giving additional uh, benefits to the user. So the brand builds. This is also a lesson for management students here. You build a brand by the kind of value you provide to your customer base, and more. That again goes through the same feedback loop where you keep on generating newer products based on market requirements, and the brand builds. And that becomes a very strong brand, and a very strong brand is very difficult to compete with by the refract. Hello, sir. 
when you digitize uh, any instrument it cannot be it cannot be innovative once again when you digitize any instrument it cannot be innovative so it's a challenge i don't understand what you mean by it cannot be innovative like uh, uh, suppose a person is uh, uh, using a flute he can come up with a new uh, you know ragas or some innovations in his uh, uh, you know play but when you digitize that can you do the same thing with that innovation because he is doing by his capability that he is coming up with a new uh, you know uh, and i can say raga also no there is a small confusion in your mind what you are talking about is creativity creativity is different from innovation when a singer or a musician performs music he or she is engaging some creative uh, talent singing a raga singing a uh, song each person will sing a song in a slightly different way different gamakas different accents that is creativity my instruments don't get into creativity they replace an existing instrument for example a tanpura right you know what is a tanpura so you have four strings tuned to shraj pancham and mandar shraj okay or mandar shraj if you are uh, from a canada kanda background panchama sarani and sarani which are both shrajas and mandar shraj and what the person who is playing the tambura is doing is just plucking it in sequence pa sa 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 pa sa 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 is a very mechanical there's no creativity there and to have a person carrying the unmeeting instrument to a concert and performing that there is no creativity there the main person who is using that as a support instrument he is or she is indulging in the creativity we are not tampering with that creativity we are making it more convenient for the musician to carry or get that shruti tambura is shruti but it is put into a small dabba which is equal to uh, easy to transport it can be put into a suitcase it can be adjust to any pitch a regular tambura cannot be adjust to either male or female male tambura is different female tambura is different so all these disadvantages that that are inherent in a traditional instrument we have got it that's what we have done and that is the innovation sir uh, i'm shreel kulaso uh, i have a question sir uh, the thing is now i have shown the block diagram wherein there is a feedback mm. to improve the game mm. now there will be two types of feedbacks mm. negative feedback and mm. the positive feedback right so in electronics we know that mm. the negative feedback eliminates the disturbances mm. and the positive feedback uh, amplifies it mm. now coming to the institute mm. wherein there are human relations mm. among the faculty the students mm. etc so the students there will be a variety of caliber level right now i i just want to ask you sir mm. at your institute mm. how do you strike out the balance between the positive and the negative feedback mm. so that there is a self learning happening mm. Mm. and they most of them they perform well so how do you strike out the balance okay uh, first of all i don't run a massive institute like what you are here it is almost like a gurukula guru shishya relationship here very small um, group of maybe 10 trainees or 8 trainees sometimes it may be even just 3 or 4 at a in a batch okay so it's a one on one training and mentoring that's happening not that it can't be done to a larger group 25 but as the group becomes larger what you say will definitely happen it's very difficult to manage uh, a large group like this and hope that you will get a one on one relationship on that it won't happen but to answer the other question about the noise that gets eliminated through feedback noise will be there every day so if you can selectively amplify the signal that you want in other words increase the signal to noise ratio through the feedback ideally speaking even if uh, somebody said positive feedback you give the gain increases but beyond the limit it becomes oscillations so you know that in a controlled amplification you can get higher gain without allowing it to get into oscillations 
That's what you need to do. Give them just the amount of uh, input that is required to facilitate them, encourage them, inspire them to go and say, okay, this seems to be fairly simple, let me go and read and try it by myself. And there will definitely there will be failures in that. Nothing wrong with failures. Failures is as much a part of learning as successes. You learn more out of failures than successes. Let me say that. And so, as parents also, many of you will overprotect your children. Don't go there, don't go here, don't cross the road. That's also bad. Certain amount of risk at that level of their age has to be taken, it's all part of life. Only then they mature and say, okay, it's our risk. Once you take small risk, then gradually you will start taking larger and larger risk. And that's partly also the answer to your question. Correct? That's where you also have to mature, your parents also have to mature in some way. To allow you to, allow you the liberties that you want to take. It's not excessive. As long as you take a risk that is life-threatening or very dangerous, yes, a parent should block it. Uh, I hope I've answered your question. So there is a certain amount of limited overseeing that happens and gradually you withdraw away and away and ultimately the student flies off out of this college very confident that he or she can survive in this cruel, wicked world. Sir, this is Sunil Kamath from CS department and I wish to ask you what is the, the main obstacle or hurdle to the path of learning, in your case maybe also, or in general? Uh, whatever I said so far, the main thing is not being given the freedom to uh, do something by themselves, make mistakes and learn. If you get rid of that obstacle, allow them into the lab, allow them to handle any of the equipment that, that is there, some of them will get spoiled. But that's a risk worth taking. If it's an equipment worth 5 lakhs or 10 lakhs, yes, monitor it closely. But ultimately, you have to allow that student to put his or her hand on that equipment and use it and derive the benefit. So the same way, a parent also, that's exactly what I explained just now. You need to allow students to, your children, to do whatever they want as long as it's useful, as long as it's moral, as long as it's uh, permitted to engage in an activity that will increase their exposure. And why not, the, this is also a, uh, something that I mentioned, why not the exposure? It could be not just, I talked about modeling, not just aroma, maybe uh, painting, painting, maybe uh, um, sculpture. There are so many engaging activities that can add value to the students' knowledge and the learning process that once they have uh, uh, experienced the process of learning, they find that full of fun and excitement. They will not stop learning anything. They will keep multiplying. Whatever they see something, they say, okay, this is interesting, I want to learn that. They will learn. So the problem basically is with parents and teachers who say, don't do this, or not giving them an opportunity to do things. Anything more? Any more questions? Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. So, uh, according to you, sir, being good at one field uh, will help you uh, in uh, innovating or uh, being good or being an average level in all the field is good yeah, to innovate. To innovate. Uh, it's very difficult to, it's not a black and white line where you say this group will innovate, this group will not innovate. No. So, having a wider area of domain expertise will increase the opportunities of I didn't even know where you can bring an innovative idea. Okay? So I say that 
If something is you find, find something being done in a, let's say, a hydraulic product, and you suddenly it strikes you that something similar can be done in an electronic product. Because of the fact that you have got exposed to both these fields, you are likely to say, okay, it can happen there, why not here, right? And how can I do it? So your thought process works in that direction. Okay? It also involves, and this again is the upbringing, where you are encouraged to go off the beaten track. You know the meaning of going off the beaten track? Beaten track is, you know, when you walk in a forest, anywhere, any, with the, off the road, you go, you will find, find patches where people have walked and there is no grass there. That's a beaten track. Because people have gone, nothing, walk there continuously, nothing grows there. So you have a tendency to go on that because other people have gone, you say, okay, to an explored area, path, I will take this path. But people who say, okay, why should I take that path, I will take my own path, walk on the grass in between trees. You might find a shorter route. I very often do that. Even to this day, I'll do that. Even in a city, I try to take roads that I'm not familiar with to say, where does this lead me to? So it's the process, the thought process that I was referring to there, which will lead to innovation. It's not one, just, just not knowledge, just knowledge, not just thought process, not just environment, not just facilities, all put together. And again, let me say it once again, there is no guarantee that 100% of the people who are into that ecosystem will be innovative. No. Only one or two will get that brainwave suddenly saying, hey, this can be done in a different way. Let me do this. Let me try. So the objective here is not to just be an innovator. No. Get into an area where you can design, where you can conceptualize, and you will get an opportunity to innovate if you are lucky. I won't say it's guaranteed. It all depends on opportunities, the context, and your ability to grasp a problem as it throws up with your background of education, knowledge, etc. And if you are able to say, okay, I can do this. It's a confluence of factors that results in an innovation. I innovated my musical instrument because I was a musician. I had I saw my mother sitting in front of me playing the tanpura, putting the tala for me. I said, why should she be here? What can I do about it? That's the thought process. That's the starting point. And if I had electronics domain, I said, can I do something using electronics? You see that? So the opportunity, and you will have to see exactly, and you can't, there can't be a guarantee saying you will get an opportunity or so many opportunities this year, this month, this day, no. It just triggers out of a confluence of situations. And at that point of time, if you are there and if you have got a bright idea, an innovation happens. Again, innovation can be in different grades. Very simple innovation, very complex, path-breaking innovations. So if you are in an ecosystem, you will be part of some of the eco you know, innovations if it's not completely your own invention, you'll be part, you'll be assisting somebody else as part of the innovation. That's all I'm trying to make. So that's the end of the question, sir. And thank, thank you all you for your questions. I'm quite happy with your response.